Love us, Ritas. Okay, Sarkasi. I hope everyone is having a wonderful morning here at day one of YGLF. It's such a privilege to have this opportunity to share the stage with so many incredible speakers. So thank you to the organizers for bringing me out. I have this indescribable joy simply being here in Lithuania because long before all of this web stuff, ever since I was seven years old, basketball was everything to me. So we're going to watch a little something first. Now, can the Lithuanians with a three beat the dream team? Sharunas Yashikevichis had destiny in his hands as he sprinted full court and threw for three. And games on the line, shots up, and he has missed it! Heartbreaking for Lithuania! The U.S. has dodged a bullet! The 2000 Sydney Olympics was broadcast live back then, and I was 13 years old. And that was the first time I ever saw the Lithuanian team play. I didn't know much about Lithuania before the Olympics, but as the tournament went on, it was obvious that they were an excellent team. That clip was from the semi-finals between the United States and Lithuania. And I think most people at the time believed that the United States would just cruise to the finals. Lithuania was down 12 points at halftime, but they came out scorching hot in the second half and tied the game with 15 and a half minutes to go. And as the Lithuanians matched the Americans point for point, it seemed like the improbable could happen. That Lithuania would knock off the high and mighty Americans on one of the biggest stages in the world. So my heart sank when that, sh that last shot by Sharunas came up short. But Lithuanian basketball had left an impression on me for life. And in 2004, Sharas didn't miss. Marbury. Drives the lane. Trying to draw the foul. Hold him. And the United States has lost to Lithuania. For the first time, they are still not out of a chance to win a gold medal. The United States, if you're bringing final preliminary game against Angola, they would make it in to the quarterfinal round. It's still very much alive. This game is instead of the top. And though the United States probably played their best game at these Olympics thus far, Lithuania is a team that, if they won, it's not considered an upset. The difference in the game was. So as Team Lithuania walked off the court, their heads held high, it felt as if they had won the gold already. So, yes, Lithuania has always had a special place in my heart, but I would have never imagined that I would find myself here in Vilnius way after my basketball career was over, about to open You Gotta Love Front End with a talk about web topography. Web topography is a topic that has been covered extensively by numerous amazing speakers, so what I'd like to bring to the table today is some additional perspective about non-English topography as well, hence the title, Typesetting for a Global Web. My name is Hui Jing. You can also call me Jing, and these are the emojis that describe me. It's probably not that obvious what this fox is for, but I use it to indicate that I am a Mozilla tech speaker, which is an initiative by Mozilla to support technical evangelists in regional communities around the world by providing resources and funding. And I'm not the only tech speaker here today. You'll be hearing from another tech speaker tomorrow, more of us in the audience. I also have a day job as a developer advocate with Nexmo. So, out of curiosity, I don't think most of you have heard of Nexmo. Has anyone heard of Nexmo at all? Just the people I know. Great. Nexmo being a platform that provides APIs for messaging, voice, and authentication, so developers can easily integrate communications into their own applications. Before we dig into web topography, let's take a step back and think about topography itself. Because it seems like almost everyone in their cat has a definition for it. Wikipedia calls it the art and technique of arranging type. Matthew Butrick 
whose article is the first result when you Google what is typography. He defines it as the visual component of the written word. Encyclopedia Britannica has its own rather long definition, but personally I like this one by Garrett Nortje, which says that topography is writing with prefabricated letters. This particular definition is not tied to any specific medium. Topography as a discipline will continue to evolve as mediums change over time. Now, letters are mentioned in most of the definitions, and letters are a type of grapheme, which is the smallest unit of a writing system of any given language. The World Writing Systems website presents one glyph of each of the world's writing systems. This site is part of the Missing Scripts project, which is a long-term initiative to identify writing systems which are not yet encoded in the Unicode standard. Right now, there are still 146 scripts which cannot be found in Unicode, and hence cannot be displayed on screens as textual content. A large number of the world's writing systems are alphabetic in nature, where a relatively small set of letters can be combined in many different ways to form words, phrases, and sentences. Transforming something we hear and say into something we see and read. Currently, the dominant writing system is the Latin alphabet, Originating from Italy in the 7th century, it has its roots in the Etruscan, Greek, and Phoenician alphabet. This writing system spread with the expansion of the Roman Empire, and yet again in the early modern period, when massive waves of European colonization of the Americas, Oceania, parts of Asia and Africa took place. The result of which gives us numbers that you see on this chart here with Chinese and Arabic, a very distant second and third, and also giving us a geographic distribution that looks like this, where the bright yellow areas represent countries who only use the Latin script, while the pale yellow areas show countries which use the Latin script in addition to others. In fact, even the grey areas, they have Latin script alphabets in use as unofficial second languages or for transliteration purposes, things like that. Of course, not all Latin scripts use the same alphabet, and neither are alphabets restricted to Latin scripts alone. The English language contains 26 letters, all of which are fairly vanilla, you know, no diacritics, no circumflexes, no ligatures, unlike Lithuanian or Latvian, for example. Now, relating this back to topography and the concept of prefabricated letters, when we pick typefaces, be it in the physical or digital world, there may be instances where a particular character's glyph is missing from the typeface. So what are glyphs, then? Well, let's look, take a look at some examples. So first, we've got this nice wooden E with a circumflex. That's considered a glyph. This is a bitmap Chinese character. It's also a glyph. A vector Cyrillic D. All of these are glyphs. So a glyph is a specific shape of a letter or character in a particular font. Now, in the digital world where everything is data, glyphs can be described as an array of pixels, collections of vector images, or even paths of Bezier curves and straight lines. So the next question would be, what about fonts? What are those? Fonts can be thought of as collections of glyphs. So in the world of metal typesetting, these are fonts. So some of you may have seen this image. It's, these are drawers containing metal sorts used in letterpress printing. But in the digital world, these are fonts. Specifically, these are font files. Now, all digital files are simply long lists of numbers stored as binary on a storage device. And file formats are what allow us to read and understand the data that these numbers represent. Different font formats store information about the font, like their glyphs, their encoding, metadata about the font, and so on, slightly differently, depending on how their specifications were written. 
So this is supposed to be a talk about web topography. So let's take a closer look at content on the web. 54% of websites are in English. Can anybody take a guess how many native English speakers there are in the world today, you know, as a percentage of world population? Just give me random numbers. Anybody? Thank you. That is exactly the correct answer, 5%. The distribution of languages is much more spread out in the real world than on the web. Chinese native speakers are around 17% of the world's population, and next is Spanish at about 6.4%. But languages, they're extremely important and emblematic of a people's identity. And I think that Lithuania is one of the best proof points for this statement that I just made. As a result of the Sasu Limas in 1863, Sir Alexander II banned the use of the Latin alphabet, and no publication in the Lithuanian language was permitted. Now, this ban remained in force for 40 years from 1864 to 1904, which I believe many of you are aware. But what the Russians did not realize was that this cemented the Lithuanian language as central to the national identity, and it consolidated support for an independent Lithuanian nation-state amongst almost all the Lietuvai. In spite of harsh measures to snuff out the Lietuvių kalba, and by extension, Lietuvos kultura, Knignashe kept Lithuanian literature alive, and by the final years of the ban, Lithuanian books had reached every settlement in the country. Writing systems are more than just a means of communication. They're also a reflection of a people's culture, their identity, and even their soul. As more and more of our communications move onto the digital realm and into the online world, it is important that we preserve that language diversity. It is crucial that a technology meant to be ubiquitous supports the creation of local content across the world. That every writing system in the world can be correctly rendered on the web. So, let's assume that Unicode supports the requisite characters for a particular language, and that typeface designers have taken the effort to support that language by designing all the relevant glyphs. How should we, as people who implement content on the web, make sure that we are doing our part in this effort to make sure that languages are presented correctly? We can start by understanding more about digital fonts and typesetting for the web. Declaring a content language on an element is one of the most basic things we can do because it identifies the specific written form of the language to be used in that element, aka the content writing system. Now, this is important because language and writing system conventions affect a lot of typographic effects like line breaking, hyphenation, justification, glyph substitution, and so on. For CSS, language-specific typographic tailorings are only applied when the content language is explicitly declared. So it is in our best interest to tell the browser exactly what language our content is in to ensure a higher typographic experience for all of our users. But before we go deeper into typesetting, let's talk about the characters that we're trying to typeset first. Now, the earliest digital fonts, they were pixel-based bitmaps, which, you know, were okay for the low-resolution screens at the time, but problematic when content needed to be printed, because printers were high-resolution. So one of the solutions to this problem came from Adobe founder John Warnock. He had founded Adobe Systems in December 1982 with Charles Geschke. Now, together with Doug Brotz, Ed Taft, and Bill Paxson, they created a page description language called PostScript, which went to market in 1984. 
Postscript was great for printing, but it also handled fonts very well. Now, an issue with fonts at the time was that they did not scale linearly at small sizes. Glyphs would get distorted during scaling. But Postscript handled this by providing additional metadata as font hints. This was a highly secret technology, and the hinted fonts were compressed and encrypted into what Adobe called a Type 1 font, which only stored outline information, the very first vector font format. And it did really well on the market. So TrueType was Apple and Microsoft's answer to Adobe's font monopoly. Now, both companies then worked separately to improve TrueType, especially with regards to fonts for East Asian writing systems. Apple came up with TrueType GX, later renamed Apple Advanced Typography, while Microsoft came up with TrueType Open in 1994. Eventually, Adobe actually joined in that effort, and together they developed OpenType which I think most of us use today, OTF files. But Microsoft also came up with this thing called EOT, or Embedded Open Type, and tried to submit this as a W3C recommendation. However, it was rejected in favor of WAF, Web Open Font Format. Now, WAF is a font packaging format designed to provide lightweight, easy to implement compression of font data. Any properly licensed TrueType, OpenType, open font format could be packaged in WAF for web use. And WAF 2 is simply an improvement over WAF with significantly better compression rates. Now, while we're on the topic of the history of fonts, it makes sense to also think about how fonts evolved on the web as well. Back in 1996, when CSS first became a W3C recommendation, there was a font property section defining font family, font style, font variant, font weight, font size, and also you know, font as a shorthand. And there was also the infamous font tag introduced in HTML 3.2 to define the font size, color, and face for its contents via attributes. This tag is now obsolete, and you are advised not to use it. But I mean, if you really want to, you're free to try. But you could clearly define different font families, although they were only limited to system fonts. Now, not, not long after that, there was a working draft which proposed the possibility of loading font data from external sources via a URL. And this is the earliest public instance that I could find describing the at font face rule. Now, the original five font properties are still around. They haven't changed all that much, though with the advent of variable fonts, which we will be touching on a little later, there are more values now available for use. Now, much of this latest and greatest can be found in level four of the CSS fonts specification. Generic font families were introduced in CSS2 and left it up to user agents to provide reasonable default choices. And these choices are supposed to express the characteristics of each family as well as possible. I just quoted off the spec, but it sounds like a very laissez-faire approach to do things. It's like the spec writers were telling the browser makers, like, YOLO, you do you, as long as it fits. So it's kind of weird, but this is what we end up with. And there's an algorithm that browsers use to determine which fonts to load and use on your page. And even though this algorithm has expanded quite a lot over the past two decades, this is a general idea of what's actually going on beneath the hood of your browser. So the user agent will take the first family name defined in the font family property. If it is a generic family keyword, the UA will just pick the one it always uses, then load that. Otherwise, it will try to find a family from the fonts declared through font face. Now, once matched, the UA will assemble a set of font faces in the family, then pick the appropriate font based on the declared font properties. 
But if no matching face exists, or if the matched face is missing, the glyph that needs to be rendered, the next family name is considered, and the UA runs through the steps again. And once a font face is matched, the font will be loaded. If all the font family names have been run through and still no font face matches, then a system fallback font will be called into play. Most of the time, system fonts will support an extended character set covering a majority of languages. But with our newfound knowledge of how browsers figure out which font to use, I think it's become clearer why we have this concept of font stacks. Now, the order of the declared fonts matters because the browser goes through them from left to right. For a given run of text, the if the browser encounters a character the first font doesn't support, it will run the algorithm for the next font on the list and so on for each character. So it's a per-character assessment of what font needs to be loaded. Now, ideally, your font stack should be made up of fonts that share similar characteristics, so it's not that obvious that a fallback font has been invoked for a particular missing glyph. So you'd go for, things, go for fonts with similar visual styles, similar X heights, similar stroke weights, that sort of thing. Otherwise, you might end up with this tragic situation that happens on a relatively popular blogging site, <coughs> Medium. And like my friend Vadim replied on my Twitter thread, it's not lethal, but it sure as hell is ugly, right? I mean, look at that. Now, if a character cannot be displayed using any font at all, for example, this particularly infamous Chinese character, it's pronounced biang. You'll end up with a symbol of the missing glyph. This, this is not a font, this is an SVG, because Unicode doesn't have this ridiculous character. And if you, don't, if you have a missing glyph, what you end up with are these blank rectangles. Now, sometimes you'll see a corresponding character code within these rectangles, or simply just a blank rectangle. But personally, such situations I encounter much less of these days compared to a decade ago, thanks to the widespread use of Unicode. But you know where we see these tofu characters these days? I find that I see them when the newest emojis are released and the software I'm using, <coughs> Slack, hasn't updated to support them yet. So this is an example of the font face rule. And if you ever tried loading web fonts in your own projects, you'd probably have written something similar. So given the support status these days, a lot of green, right? It's fairly safe to use just WAF and WAF2, because it used to be that we had to declare a whole list. Um, this is good enough for most, for most purposes these days. Now, some fun facts about the font face rule. There are actually many descriptors, but only the font family and the source are mandatory. Now, the font family descriptor works purely like a label. So we can reference the font data via CSS. So maybe you're using a font like Helvetica. You don't have to put Helvetica as the descriptor. You could call it Salty Basche, and it would still work. You know, name it anything you want. Call it the name of your cat. The source descriptor tells the browser where to find the font data. So it could be an external URL or a locally installed system font. And the font hint is an optional parameter. So this is the full set of all the descriptors that you could use in your font face rule. Now, descriptors for style, weight, stretch, these are used to match styles to a particular typeface in later CSS declarations. If you're really bored at work and you're as annoying a person as I am, you could swap some font descriptor values around. You know, maybe the italics and the bolts, just swap the values. And your teammates will be left wondering why all their M elements 
suddenly turned bold. And they might not figure it out for a while because this change is sort of subtle. I mean, if office pranks are your thing, I'm just saying, if you do get into trouble, I had nothing to do with it, hashtag don't get fired. Now, at this point, I want to shout out the Firefox front tools and the entire team who works on DevTools. Sometime last year, Patrick Brossett, who does a lot of work on front tools, he pinged me on Twitter about a feature for detecting missing characters. Now, I'm sure he'd been thinking about it and working on it for quite a bit, but it was still an amazing surprise to see that he already had a working prototype the following day. Now, the fonts panel has been around in Firefox for quite a while now, possibly since version 24. But over the past two years, Firefox has really upped their DevTools game. They've got by far the best grid inspector, they've got a flexbox inspector, they've got shapes editor, I could go on. But fonts, right? So version 63 shipped with a suite of font tools, including the polished up version of the font highlighter demonstrated in these above tweets. So this is how it looks like in action, where you can see which fonts are loaded onto the page and which fonts are loaded for which characters on your page. Now, there's also information about all the fonts on the page at the bottom, so you can check if your font face rules have you know, any potential shenanigans that happen. You can check it here. Now, this tool comes in very handy, especially for me, when I just have a handful of words in a foreign language and the typeface I'm using does not support that language. For example, this round sans serif, it's called Railway, designed by the League of Movable Type. It's pretty nice, in my opinion, but unfortunately it does not support Cyrillic characters. Which is a bummer if I wanted to use it for a talk I'm giving in, say, maybe Ukraine, for example. So what we can do is we can try to find a font that does contain Cyrillic characters and somewhat resembles Railway, and then we utilize something called a Unicode range descriptor to create a composite font. Now, it's called a composite font because it mixes glyphs from different fonts for different scripts. Now, to deal with the fact that Railway does not support Cyrillic letters, we can use this Unicode range descriptor to tell the browser to load uh, Comforta, which is a font that does when it does encounter any Cyrillic characters. Because remember, for font face rules, the font family is simply a label. So what we've done here is that we've created a composite font that uses the name Railway, but in actuality, it loads two different font files depending on what characters need to be displayed. Now, the font highlighter tool reveals what the browser does when it encounters such a scenario. Railway is the font family descriptor, but you can see that Firefox has loaded both Railway and Comforter regular. The font tools can also tell you which font format that the browser has currently loaded for a particular run of text. CSS for fonts and text, these are our typesetting tools for the web. And when you use them in your CSS declarations, imagine that you're running your own print workshop, right? And you're telling your apprentice, in this case, your browser, that you need a font which is a particular size, style, weight, etc. And then your apprentice will run off to the back room where all the fonts are kept and tries to find the font that best matches your instructions from the descriptor you assigned in the font face rule. So these font properties are pretty much your instruction set to your apprentice. But just like how when we give instructions to an apprentice or an intern, there may be instances where they, what they produce isn't really what we want. For example, say, you know, we picked a typeface, we didn't check, and we re without realizing it only had one regular style, but somewhere in our CSS, we've requested either a bold weight or, you know, an italic style. Now, when the browser encounters such a situation, by default, it will try to create these bolds or italics based on the regular font. Try. The end result doesn't look that great. 
So also under normal circumstances, Chinese fonts do not have italic variants. So there's this property called font synthesis that we can set to a value of none to instruct your browser to just leave the font alone. Now, there's been quite a bit of work going on with fonts lately, and variable fonts build on top of some of the original properties, like weight, style, stretch, to take in newer ranges of variation axes values. But there are plenty of additional variation axes for designers to play around with. So here, this is a font. It's a variable font called movement. And it actually has two variation axes for space and weight. So what we can do here, if, if I adjust the value of space, you can sort of see that the style of the font itself just changes, right? And I can also do this for weight. And you'll notice that instead of 100 to in, in denominations of 100, it actually goes down to denominations of 1, right? And all of this is possible with a single font file. If we had wanted to do this with regular fonts, can you imagine how many font files I would have had to load? So one of the biggest upsides of variable fonts is on the performance front of things. Such developments are extremely significant, especially for the CJK languages. CJK referring to Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. Basically, these are languages which utilize Han characters, a writing system that contains upwards of tens of thousands of glyphs. Currently, websites in these languages almost exclusively use system fonts, because a typical CJK font can go up to around 16 megabytes. Font services like Monotype and Typekit, they offer this option of dynamic subsetting, where font files are served with only the glyphs needed for each page. But these solutions have limitations, like they will lose their open type features during subsetting. And there's also the caching issue, because you're requesting new font files for every page. But we could potentially be seeing some breakthroughs in the near future. Currently, there is an industry-wide collaboration between Adobe, Apple, Google, Montype, and Mozilla, plus a number of type foundries and software vendors to resolve the issues that I just described. In order to tackle the limitations of current font subsetting strategies, this web font performance super collaboration is working on a solution that allows for the subsetting of a font request to only what's required on a page, but progressively add on to that original font request for subsequent pages. So we can see a prototype of this in action on the incremental transfer demo by the Google Fonts team. I'm going to replay this. It's not playing. Yeah. So as I keep adding text from various different scripts, it's a bit small, I'm sorry. But as I keep adding text from the various different scripts, you can see the vast difference between what we do today, which is the very first one, and what could be possible in the future, the incremental transfer. So it's a difference of more than 20 kilobytes. And these savings are quite significant. And the end result is much closer to the optimal subset than whatever our current implementation can do today, which just sends every single file over the wire. Jason Parmental, web topography expert and invited expert to the W3C Web Fonts Working Group, first wrote about this in his newsletter, Web Topography News, back in late April this year. And I highly recommend subscribing to this newsletter if that's something that you're interested in. Now, earlier when I talked about all the different font formats, I mentioned that Apple and Microsoft worked to improve the original implementation of TrueType. Now, OpenType and Apple Advanced Topography are what we term as modern font technologies, and they can contain a lot more glyphs than previous font formats. OpenType fonts include an expanded character set and layout features, which give us much more broader linguistic support and more precise typographic control. They can also make multilingual topography easier by allowing different uh, multiple language character sets in a single font. 
So font feature properties were first introduced in CSS fonts level three. Now they give us access to a variety of typographic features like swashes, ligatures, old style numerals, and so on, if the font we're using supports these features, which means we can toggle such features using CSS. Now, if you're wondering, like, what's the point of having all these so-called typographic features anyway? I mean, aren't letters just letters? But they're part and parcel of good typography, which is necessary to hold your reader's attention. The written word is a transference of speech, which is heard, into something visual, which is seen. Now, good speakers, they will vary their cadence, they will use gestures, they will emphasize certain words, and typographic features like small caps, correct use of italics and punctuation, these do the same for text. Now, other things like old-style numerals and ligatures, they help maintain an even typographic color, which make the reading experience a lot more comfortable for your users. Now, there's one particular font variant property for East Asian text, which allows us to control glyph substitution and positioning for Han characters. Now, I understand that a lot of the audience don't actually read Chinese, so just kind of focus your attention on that run of text. So, the default value for this property is simplified, but if I change it to traditional, and I'm just going to toggle, you'll notice that some of the glyphs change. But in the markup itself, that run of text is just one single. There's not multiple characters. So CSS allows us to toggle these glyphs. Also, if you happen to read Japanese, the Japanese language uh, is subset into different groups under the Japanese industrial standard. So here, JIS 78 is activated. But under normal circumstances, these are all the glyphs. So if you choose only JIS 78, you only see these two glyphs. So this is a very specific CSS property for East Asian characters. There's also something called font language override. Now this property is interesting because the user agent will refer to the lang attribute when rendering text. But if a selected font lacks support for that language, we can ask the browser to use the typographic conventions of a related language that is present in the font you used instead. So for example, this is the markup for some Macedonian text. Now imagine that the font being used does not support Macedonian, but has characters for Serbian. So Macedonian and Serbian are related languages, so to speak. By setting font language override to SRB, the Macedonian text will be rendered somewhat correctly with Serbian typographic conventions, but still be recognized as Macedonian text. Now, a friend of mine, he's called Roel, he built a tool that can tell you what features that a font has and the appropriate CSS you can use to toggle them. It also has the best name of any app that I've ever seen in my life. Listen. What can my font do? What can my font do? So by that, by that alone, you should really check it out. It's a very interesting website, wakamaifondu.com. Tell, yeah, support, support. Now, if you're interested in web topography at all, I highly recommend getting a copy of Web Topography by Richard Rutter. It is the most comprehensive resource that I personally know of. This is my own personal copy. And also do watch this really great talk by him at CSS Day last year, where he goes through some of these golden rules for web topography. Now, these rules, they are universal, regardless of language, but there are certain language-specific behaviors that CSS can help us address as well. Now, most of the time, we use text transform for case adjustments and capitalization, but it actually does take into account numerous language-specific case mapping rules. So, for example, the German S it becomes a double S in uppercase. 
right? Or the Greek vowels, they lose their accent when the entire word is uppercase. So things like that, very subtle. And there's also a particular value that's only applicable to Japanese text. It's called full-size kana. So what it does is it converts all the small kana characters into their equivalent full size. And this is mostly used for ruby annotations, largely used for educational texts. And here we have inline boxes, right? So this, I'm going to explain a bit. We have five inline boxes in this run of text. So if an element is one, generate zero boxes is a second. Comma was it is a third line box, really there, fourth at all question mark is a fifth. So for now there's enough room, so all five of these inline boxes fit into one single line box. But if there isn't enough room, say if I adjust the font size up, what happens is that inline boxes will be broken across line boxes, and that break is known as a line break. These particular lines were broken due to content wrapping, hence known as a soft wrap break. If wrapping is enabled, the user agent, your browser, has to minimize the amount of content overflowing that a line break has by wrapping the line at a soft break opportunity if one exists. Now, for most writing systems, soft wrap opportunities occur at word boundaries, where spaces or punctuation are used to explicitly separate words. Hang on. Where's my cursor? Now, if you're thinking, breaking lines, how hard can that be? Well, there's a lot of nuance because word breaking works differently depending on the language we're typesetting for. For example, English wraps at spaces and punctuation, it's fine. But for Japanese and Chinese characters, the break is per character, usually but not always, because line breaks are prohibited before certain punctuation marks. And a number of Southeast Asian scripts are written without spaces between words. Then the text is wrapped at syllable boundaries in addition to word boundaries. We could keep going on here, but the point is there are lots of different conventions that non-English languages have to take care of. And there's also an interplay between the four properties here to provide developers a more precise control over line breaking because some rules take precedence over others if both are present, or some only take effect if the white space property allows wrapping, for example. So there's actually a lot of complexity going on here. Now, I highly recommend watching Florian Rivowal, co-editor of the CSS text specification, explain all of this in his talk at .css last year. And if you're not exactly sure what I just mentioned for the past 20 minutes, like very confusing, just set the lang attribute. Because setting the lang attribute takes care of some of this stuff for you. Some. Which is way better than none. Text justification. Now, this is not a trivial computer science problem. I've seen programming assignments for Markov chains asking for text justification algorithms. But whether we realize it or not, most of us would have encountered two major justification algorithms. We have the greedy algorithm, which analyzes only a single line, and the much more advanced Nuth Plus algorithm, which analyzes every line in a paragraph. Design software with advanced typesetting capabilities like InDesign, they use Nuf Plus. But browsers, sadly, they use the simple one. Probably for performance reasons, I'm not too sure. But although we don't have a robust justification algorithm, CSS Text Level 3 does include this text justify property to allow some further tweaking of justified text. Now, I'm not sure how many of you went to Vilnius JS a couple days ago, where Adrian specifically mentioned how text justification is not encouraged. And if I search for text justify web on Google, top result is titled, don't use fully justified text alignment on your website. Next one says, 
justify text with HTML and CSS? Don't do it. It seems like justified text has a bad rap on the web, and probably so for Latin-based scripts, but not so for Chinese characters, which are also known as square characters. Now, each character is composed within a uniform square, and Chinese texts can be typeset into very neat rows and columns. In fact, it is ideal to do so. But when there are both Latin alphabets and Chinese characters, it is impossible for everything to line up both vertically and horizontally. So the next best thing is to ensure that the start and end of every line is aligned well. So we can make adjustments between adjacent typography character units in Chinese text with a value called inter-character. So as you can see, it becomes much neater when we turn it on. Finally, writing systems are also not limited to a horizontal top-to-bottom direction. Traditionally, East Asian languages were all written vertically. Uh, we have languages like Arabic and Hebrew that are written from right to left. Rotating lines of text, no wait, sorry. The writing mode property specifically caters for vertical writing on the web. Now, this is the default. On the top, horizontal, top to bottom, there are a number of vertical options. And there's also a sideways option that has formally been moved to level four. Firefox has it implemented, so you can see it here. So there's a lot of options that you can do if you want to do vertical text on the web. And when you rotate lines of text, all the individual characters within that line are affected as well. Now, browsers are smart enough to tell that Chinese characters, which are a dual direction language, they will always be displayed upright. But if you have a horizontal only language like English, their characters will be rotated when vertical. So this text orientation property allows you to control whether you want all your characters upright or sideways, depending on the design decisions that you're making. And there's also a text combined upright property which addresses the issue of, say, numerals or abbreviations in vertical text. For example, if your text contains dates, then this property lets you fit all the digits of your date into the width of one character, then display them upright. So there's this last value here called digits. Unfortunately, no browser supports it yet, but it really does make sense to have some sort of limit on this particular property because four digits is probably the maximum that you can push within such a tiny space. Nine characters looks very uncomfortable, and 13 is just ridiculous. Please don't do this. Now, vertical text may be better suited for East Asian languages when it comes to full-length body copy, but that doesn't mean that other languages can't get in on the fun. We see vertical text set in print all the time. So headers or short runs of text, I think they are relatively safe to typeset vertically. So we can do stuff like this, you know, to add some typographic variety to your web layouts. Or we could even combine writing mode with other CSS properties, like say maybe transforms. There are a lot of possibilities with modern CSS these days. Now I spoke a bit more about East Asian topography because Chinese is my mother tongue, and I am involved with the Chinese Layout Task Force. Now, if you notice, there are also other Layout Task Force for numerous other scripts, and this is definitely a step in the right direction when it comes to preserving language diversity on the web. Now, an ideographic language like Chinese was not a good candidate for movable type printing. The calligraphic style of Arabic writing also resulted in efforts to reduce the number of variations of letters and diacritical marks for movable type printing. And such typographical compromises are akin to having the finest sculptures in the world caked in mud and dirt. Now, I think the digital age presents an opportunity to clean off the dirt and mud of these scripts that have long had to compromise to get with the times. Our digital age is the age of light, 
and electronic signals, and there are far fewer limitations as compared to a physical medium like movable type. So if the virtual world is touted as a realm with limitless possibilities, then it should only be reasonable to expect that all of our scripts can be restored to their full artistic glory on the World Wide Web. Achoo. <laughs>